Welcome, everyone. It's good to have you all here. Uh, I know that uh, it, it seems ironic every single Sunday when I say that because what I'm doing is I'm looking into the camera and beyond the camera I see Judy and Jim Zerubic up in the balcony. But nevertheless, you are all here as you can see by the pictures attached to the pews, not just because the pictures are there, but because you are all here and I miss you very much. However, I am so glad that you are all willing to stay physically distant and tune in digitally through our live stream or through the recording. As usual, I want to give a big thanks to David Hamilton, who uh, uh, besides his usual Sunday morning duties has also been drafted at the last minute to do the carol sing, to Shirley Beeman and to Esther Marshall, who are uh, helping us with uh, the music singing so you don't have to listen to just me. Unfortunately, Liz Coates was going to be here and to lead our carol sing, but she is not feeling well this morning. So our prayers go out to Liz and we hope that she feels better soon. Slide presentation was put together by Sarah McKenzie, the uh, uh, AV team in the balcony, Jim and Judy Zerubic, thank you very much, especially when one of our flash drives didn't work this morning, and so we had to scramble a little bit. And, uh, and Judy looked at me with the calm gaze and demeanor that she always has when I said, by the way, there's an extra video that I discovered last night when I was doing final preparations on my sermon, and uh, could you just kind of slip that in? I'll let you know when to play it. And she just nodded her head, and uh, I'm sure that, uh, that Jim got an earful when Judy got to the balcony. <laughs> Nevertheless, thanks to Stu Metzger for keeping the church warm and well-maintained and clean, to John Phillips and Liz Dillman who keep our finances well in hand. Thank you very much. There are uh, screens that we use, so whenever you see the red print in bold, it's for the worship leader, in this case me, to read. And whenever you see the black print in bold, it's for everyone to read together. Although Judy Zerubic will be uh, uh, leading that primarily throughout the service so that you don't always hear my voice. Let's practice that as we acknowledge the land and territory on which we are uh, privileged to gather. For thousands of years, First Nations peoples have walked this land. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and of their spirituality. We begin our worship this morning by acknowledging the unceded territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe. We are all treaty people, parties to Crown Treaty 45 and a half in 1836. Keep us mindful of the covenants that we have make, been made and broken with First Nations peoples. May we grow into living with respect on this land, walking into reconciliation through peace and friendship while honoring all who live, work, and worship on it. There are some announcements that I would like to highlight this morning, and uh, so uh, there's a few. The first one is, that there are only two weeks left. Now, you may not be able to read the cartoon very easily, so I'll read it to you. It's the three magi, and actually that's two years probably after Jesus was born. But nevertheless, too late, it says, one of the wise men realized he'd brought his gag gift jar of, more, of myrrh by mistake. But you can give the gift you want to give because there's only two weeks left if you want to get it in get it in before december 31st and it will be credited to your 2020 income tax return and that way we'll make sure that that uh, it gets out to you uh, please send your checks in by either mail or e-transfer or through the other means that are on our website uh, to make a donation you truly do make a difference and we are really appreciative our envelope steward, John Phillips, will be sending donation tax receipts, mostly by email. So if you have changed your email, your postal address, your phone number, or other contact information that we need, please call the church office to update that essential information. The current information, will, the current information that you provide to us will ensure a smooth delivery to every person in the new year. After all, your generosity really does deserve recognition. Now, there's a new cartoon. It says, uh, the, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is saying to the little drummer boy, I appreciate the thought, but I just got Jesus to sleep. 
So, how can you keep from singing? See, Esther and, and Shirley are here, and they're helping us out uh, to make sure that there's a more fulsome sound when we sing the hymns. If you are interested in helping out in that way, please contact David Hamilton. He will make sure to schedule you in, and we would love to have you here. Of course, we always observe um, uh, careful safety protocols in this pandemic. You can see that they're uh, quite distant from each other and they don't share microphones and uh, that way we keep each other safe. Whenever we're not on camera, we've got our masks on. As well, annual reports. It's closing in on the end of the year, so if you have an annual report that you need to write, now's the time to get started on that. The deadline for those reports to be submitted to uh, Sarah McKenzie, our office coordinator, and the email address is there, is Sunday, January the 10th. That's four weeks. That's it. So please, uh, get those completed. The, uh, the New Capital Project has a new cartoon, and it says, uh, Mary's uh, talking to Joseph behind her. Uh, Honey, do you remember who gave us the myrrh? Apparently I've got a myrrh theme going on this morning, but nevertheless, uh, uh, the online instructions are there uh, to tell you how to give to the capital project. Over $14,000 has been raised to date, and in fact, um, we had to replace the fan motor in one of the furnaces uh, just this past week. So there is a, a pretty good reason why we've got this capital project ongoing. And recent services can be found on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can also find the services a week later on Rogers Cable 6. So if you're watching this on Rogers Cable 6, it is uh, December the 27th or later. You can also view past services online at, at the Rogers website, and no cable TV is necessary for that. Then we also have a Christmas Eve candlelight and carol service that will be happening on Christmas Eve at 7 o'clock. Um, there will be a traditional uh, carol uh, service like we always have. Have a candle ready to light at home so that for each person that's watching, so that you too can be part of the candle lighting. And during the service, there'll be a time to light your candle and a time to extinguish it. And that way we can share that collective activity. We certainly will miss gathering together face to face, but we will be digitally connected. And finally, we are connect, oh, pardon me. Uh, the, if you want to connect to our Christmas Eve and Candlelight Carol service, the information is now posted on our website, and uh, you can find it on the left side of our homepage. Fireside chats happen every Tuesday and are usually posted within 24 hours to our YouTube channel. So feel free to access those. You'll find some humor, a reflection, some music, a prayer, and a blessing all in about 20, 24 minutes. As the church has done for millennia, I greet you all. May the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. And I'd invite you to share that peace with whomever happens to be around you. If you're alone, share it with yourself. Go to the mirror and, and feel silly, but nobody's watching. Peace. Let's join together in recognizing the ever-presence of God within us, around us, and sometimes despite us as we pre prepare ourselves for worship.
we come before the Advent wreath. And we're getting tired of waiting, of preparing, of marking time, yet we come. We come because we need perspective, the bigger picture of faith, along with the desire for clear directions for the road ahead. We long for what might yet be, yearning to know this waiting is purposeful. We come anxious in our uncertainty, seeking color in our lives, which too often feel monotone. We struggle to figure out how to make this Christmas one to remember fondly, instead of remembering it as the season of our discontent. We come in expectation for God's word of good news. As we come, let us open ourselves to the shining of the light of the world. Let us join as one community of faith in prayer. That's what begins, isn't it, God? New life filled with new possibility. Tell us the story once again, that we may grow anew into your resurrection. Hope arising from dread, peace blossoming from conflict, joy bubbling from despair, and love transforming polarization. Strengthen us to welcome your mission of daring and of risk, not as something enforced or coerced, but created within a life of daunting through generous self-giving. Amen. As joined together in singing the first hymn, Angels from the Realms of Glory.
whenever we feel unworthy, like we don't matter, as if no one notices, the risen Christ assures us that each person can make a difference in love. Whenever we feel we don't measure up, like we're failures, as if we never get it right, the living spirit moves us to new insights, revealing our unique blessedness. Whenever we feel overwhelmed, like we can't cope, like there's nothing more to do, God, who is love, breathes into our souls with energy and with strength. This is the grace God showers upon us all because we are worthy of love's power. As we accept God's blessing of grace, let us take time to commune with God soul deep, opening ourselves to possibility and to promise of transformation. Amen. Okay, I'm afraid that I'm going to probably share too much about myself. I must admit that getting together for a Zoom family Christmas yesterday has made me rather nostalgic about my family and how life continues to evolve over time. Forgive me for this indulgence, but I actually have a point for it all. Here I am, little baby gourd, drooling into my bassinet mattress. Who knew that I would learn to walk by 14 months of age? Or that my little sister Barbie would follow? Or that my baby brother Mark would come along? Or that we would be such a lovely suburban family? Or that I would become one of the leaders of my youth group. All that potential in my sweet little smile. Who knew I would become a high school soccer star? Or end up in a secondary part in our high school major play? That's me in the background in the middle that would evolve into five years in my 20s as a dancer for KW Musical Productions, beard and all. Or that I would be in a major tap dance routine. Or dressed as a female gorilla of his dreams. Yes, that's me in the gorilla suit with the brassiere. Did my mom, my grandparents, and my great-grandmother ever wonder how such a perfect baby would turn out? That I would grow to love canoeing in the Grand River boat race with my dad, my sister, and my brother. That this would be a family Christmas picture with my beard closely trimmed instead of resting on my chest as it was the day before. That I would get married to this wise, talented beauty that I would be my brother's best man, as he was mine, only a month apart. That eight years later, I would celebrate my sister's marriage. Did my proud dad ever wonder how my life would unfold? The two years after he had a massive stroke, he would learn to walk all over again, despite paralysis on his right side, to see me graduate with my Masters of Divinity? that he would fall completely in love with my three children, or that he would get to celebrate his mother's 100th birthday. Did my parents worry when I sucked my thumb so passionately that I would have the privilege to marry uh, this wonderful couple in the outdoor chapel at Cave Springs Camp only six months before the groom received his second successful kidney transplant. Or that I would turn out to be such a somber soul. 
or that my then 24-year-old son would do the edge walk with me at the CN Tower, or that I would have the privilege of serving for two years as the president of the former Hamilton Conference. Now, consider the birth of the infant Jesus. In such cramped emergency surroundings, what must they have hoped for Jesus' life and how he would turn out? Would they have expected him to captivate the scholars of the Torah when they journeyed to Jerusalem for his bar mitzvah, or that he would stay behind without guilt, frightening them beyond belief because of his passion for the scriptures? This sweet, helpless, vulnerable infant Jesus, did Mary have any inkling how much joy, how much pain, how much sorrow, and what amazing revelation was in store? Did she realize the import of Jesus' baptism by his cousin John? Even as the cows lowed eating hay, did Joseph ever wonder if his son would follow in his trade as he grew? That Jesus would become a healer who never wanted credit for the healing, often asking those he healed to keep silent? That in a fit of zeal, his son would overturn the money changers' tables in the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, the same place where he sat and engaged with temple scholars at the age of 12, where once he learned and now he prophetically proclaimed what was right. From this humble, lowly beginning, did they ever wonder at the angel involvement in his birth and his escape to Egypt how that might portend for his future self? How would he choose to give himself to death on, his, on a cross? That he would forgive even those who nailed him up? That he would be abandoned by all of his so-called loyal followers, except for the women? That death would not hold him, that new life was the promise he gave to all, that an empty tomb would not signal defeat, but hope, new life, a new way? I wonder if they wondered when gazing at this little newborn child, from small things, large things may come as people are transformed. That is our legacy as those who follow. And that legacy can be lived out as we follow the words of the Lord's Prayer. This is a a little bit different version, so pay attention to the words on the screen as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. See, and I introduced that by saying they were different words, and did you pay closer attention, even though they were the same? Our Bible reading this morning is taken from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and wondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. 
he will be called son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for who, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. We'll now sing Gentle Mary Laid Her Child. Our second reading is taken from Luke chapter 1, verses 47 to 55. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. join together in prayer. Loving God, in this space, even as the rain falls outside, may your rain fall within our hearts, that we may know the way to follow your Son, 
born in humility, born out of vulnerability, yet changing the world nevertheless. May that word live within us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So imagine you are Mary, and you're just a teenager. You're betrothed to an older man, Joseph. That was, after all, the culture of the time, and that was something that was ordinary and expected. After all, you needed a man to protect you who already was securely, financially able to support you and any children that might come. And suddenly, in the middle of the night, who knows when it happened, it doesn't say. The angel Gabriel came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Now, if you have an angel visiting you, that isn't necessarily a good thing. Because you see, angel just means messenger. And where is the message coming from? Yeah, it's coming from God. And you know, God is a little bit peculiar that way. God always likes to push us to places we're not usually comfortable going. God is the one who is willing to get us to do what he does all the time, to do what she does all the time in risking, in daring, in trying to turn the world upside down. And there you are, a teenage girl, betrothed, and you're hearing that lovely greeting. And I can just imagine, I don't know if it's the same for you or not, but you know, you'd be thinking, okay, uh, and what does this mean? Because that's what it says in the, in the passage, it says this, but she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. And yes, then the shoe drops. Hey, guess what, Mary? You're pregnant. Ha ha. <laughs> Surprise! Oh, and by the way, you're not just pregnant with any old child. No, 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 no. That would be too simple. No, what's happening is you are going to bear the one they call most holy, son of God. He will inherit the kingdom of King David. You know, the one who was around a thousand years ago, the one whom all of your people, the Jewish people, the Hebrews who follow my way, the ones who always, always hearken back to King David as the ultimate model of leadership. He's going to get this child, this little one inside of you growing will grow into that perspective. Now, then Gabriel says, and of the kingdom, there will be no end. The kingdom of this child that she's to give birth to. And you can just imagine the thoughts running through her head. Um, yeah, except I'm a teenager, I'm a peasant, uh, my betrothed happens to be a a construction worker and you know what construction work is like it's pretty seasonal and the pay is great when you're working but if you're not working well that makes things a little tight and and uh, so we're supposed to raise this child in the midst of all of that in the little backwater called Nazareth although she doesn't know this yet but you can imagine the doubts that would flood her how many parents once they find out they're pregnant, worry that they won't be able to parent properly. They won't be able to provide for their child in the way they would like to. They won't be able to make their child's life better than what they experienced. They won't be able to make sure that they're launched into adulthood safely and securely. Not only that, but the angel gives her news about her cousin Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth was old. She must have been in her mid to late 30s. And uh, in that time, that was old because, you know, you were long past childbearing years, but in, uh, according to then, because after all, uh, medical science wasn't very up to date in those days. And yet, 
this was the news that you're not the only one who's pregnant. And so, you know, you've got a friend and your cousin. All of these, these thoughts flowing swiftly through Mary's mind. And then, in response to this news, this overwhelming news, we hear Mary say this, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Now, it doesn't say that, you know, the angel departed and went like that. No, no, no. No, it, it just departed. Maybe faded out. I don't know what the special effects people would do in Hollywood. But nevertheless, it was just like that was the end of the message. And it almost gives an impression of Mary as though she was meek and mild. You know, uh, the, w the way that, that some people like to see women that I don't find very helpful at all. But, you know, submissive. Go along. Do what they're told. That's what it seems like from the passage. She was, after all, young, just a teenager, not a whole lot of life experience, and certainly not expecting this pregnancy. So what else could she say when a messenger from God comes to her and says, this is what we want you to do, God says. Sometimes, a lot of times, especially during this pandemic time, we feel just as helpless as we might perceive Mary to be. We feel isolated. We tiptoe around the proper things to do. I mean, there's a reason why I hang my mask on the music stand here. It's meant to be a subtle declaration to all of you who are watching that we're following safety protocols. Really, we are, even though on camera, it looks like I'm right next to the rest of them. But it's turned our world upside down. Oh, sure, the vaccine has been certified from one company, possibly from a second one this coming week, we don't know. And the most vulnerable are being inoculated. And yet, we know, probably won't be till the fall of next year until a significant portion of our country's citizens have had the vaccine. And even then we know it's only 95% effective, therefore we've got to make sure lots and lots of people have the vaccine and we feel helpless. Yet, even in the midst of our isolation, there are stories of connection. And we need those stories of connection because the people affected by this pandemic most powerfully, most tragically, are people who are black, indigenous, or people of color. Not only that, but by far the biggest surge of infections recorded have to do with those who are working in minimum wage jobs. The ones who can't afford to work from home like I'm privileged to do. The ones who have to forgo driving a car to work because they can't afford it, so they have to take public transit if they're in the cities, or they have to walk or carpool, all of which raise the risk level for each one of them. And every single one of them are the ones who are affected most by this pandemic. Every single one of them know that if they don't go out there and earn a living, their family is not going to fare very well at all, and they will be even worse off than risking the danger of infection. Yesterday, as you heard from the sharing time, was my family Christmas. My kids, their partners, my former wife, her boyfriend, and I, all together on Zoom. <laughs> Got to see my grandson open his Christmas presents on Zoom. Yeah, not the same at all. And yet I heard from my son, who's an electrician, and he said that uh, he had just finished a, a small job on Friday 
where he was wiring up a tiny house in Kitchener where he lives. This is a, an outreach program to those who are living on the street to give them a shelter, a place they can lock the door and call their own. Because we know unequivocally that those who are living on the street do much better once they are given housing they call their own. Where they don't have to worry about their stuff getting stolen, where they don't have to worry about being accosted, bullied, or beaten up by those around them. And as we talked about it, I realized he had touched all 21 residents. Well, there's more than 21, but there's 21 houses. All of the residents of that tiny little community, because he had become a familiar face, he was the one who had wired up every single one of those little houses, and he was the one who was willing to talk with them, to make a relationship, to look on them as people just like himself who are worthy. And yes, I have to say, as a dad, my chest puffed out, even though I was sitting in a chair, and I was proud because he was doing exactly what I hoped he would do. He was following the way of Jesus and loving his neighbors as himself. He was also part of making a difference for those who are on the margins those that we might think of as down and out. And then we flash back to Mary. And we flash back to Mary, and we think of that submissive, meek, and mild soul that we thought was being portrayed in the earlier passage in Luke. And later on, Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth. After all, there's nothing better than talking to an older, wiser head about something that they have already gone through, or at least six months ahead of Mary, so they could chat, commiserate, and she could get advice about how to deal with the changes in her body and the prospect of being a mom, especially when it was so unexpected. And Elizabeth said to her, man, you tell me the story of the angel, I am so overwhelmed. That has got to be amazing. You are marked for amazing things. And Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliest of his servants. In other words, she's equating herself to the lowliest, but still a servant. This doesn't sound like the meek and mild Mary that we thought was being portrayed when the angel Gabriel spoke to her. No, this is someone different. This is someone who has a powerful message for the world. Let me share a video with you that speaks, well, rather sings of that very thing. It's based on the song, Mary, Did You Know? But it takes a very different tact and proclaims Mary's strength and prophetic witness. Did you know that your ancient words would still leap off our pages? Mary, did you know that your spirit song would echo through the ages? Did you know that your holy cry would be subversive words? That the tyrants would be trembling when they knew your truth is heard. Mary, did you know that your lullaby 
would stir your own child's passion. Mary, did you know that your song inspires the work of liberation? Did you know that your jubilee is hope within the heart for all who dream of justice? Yearn for it to start, oh Mary, did you know? The truth will teach the drama. Did you know that we hear your voice for the healing of the nations? Mary, did you know your unsettling cry can help renew creation? Do you know that we need your faith, the confidence of you? that you believe in be so Mary is not meek and mild. In fact, in the time that Mary had to consider her fate, if you will, but also more importantly, her calling. By the time she got to Elizabeth's place and Elizabeth affirmed the very strength that Mary felt called to be, she was clear. God has scattered the proud and in the thoughts of their hearts has scattered them. According to the promise God made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever, this, Mary proclaims, is part of the covenant relationship that we have with God and God with us. But we must partake of it, she is proclaiming actively. We must take up the risk and the daring torch to shine a light into the dark corners of the world, to chase away injustice, and to fight against oppression. This is our task. No matter what the cost, it is worth it because it is about love. It is about creating relationships where there isn't class, where there isn't income inequity, where there aren't those people who are looked down on where there are people who are treated as human beings because they are worthy. This is the answer to the question, surprise, Mary, you're pregnant. Now what? The answer to the question is, now what? Take up the cross and live for love in a world that aches, for it needs you. It needs us. It needs all of us. Amen.
Let's join together in prayer. In this digital gathering, O oh God, we come to you as one community of faith. We come together in humble anticipation, eager in knowing you will use our hearts, our passions, and our prayers. We gather as one in Christ's name, to care for each other as we share each other's stories, to listen carefully for your guidance toward healing and hope, to delve deeply into your heart for strength, for confidence, and for wisdom, to breathe fully of your spirit's joyful challenge, to reach out with hearts of devotion and of communion, to trust in your abundant gift of grace which makes all things new. At times, God, it's a heavy burden to share with you our stories, stories of loss, of disease, of brokenness, of depression, of illness, of worry and anxiety, of loneliness, of isolation, of Christmas gatherings drastically different, of jobs lost, of energy drained, of budgets stretched to the breaking point, of hearts weary from caring, of challenges which overwhelm us. It hurts. It drains. It worries. It's too much. In the silence, we offer it all to you as we listen for your word. Yet it is in the hurt, it is in the worrying, and it is in the draining of our energy that we find you ever present. You become the battery for our compassion, the generator for our caring, the strength for our sharing, the reason for our reaching out in prayer. In our longing and in our need, we pray that our hearts move with the same beat as your heart, the beat of love that our breath inhales the same inspiration you share, the Spirit's movement, that our eyes behold the same possibilities you promise, Christ's resurrection gift, that our hearts hear the same calling for community you give, grace lived in truth. May our minds understand the same good news Christ reveals. May our voices sing with the same joy that bubbles in your song of faith. May our arms embrace the same love you create in us. Hold us and those we lift into your care, O God, through our silent prayer. Thank you, O oh God, for strengthening us in the ministry we share. Guide us in wisdom and insight. In Jesus' strong name we ask it. Amen. So I know there are some of you who have heard of organizations that ask you to uh, buy a goat for someone overseas. So I want to offer you this video on how you might wrap that goat.
amazed that they were able to figure out how to wrap the goat. I sent this uh, video to my two brothers-in-law who live on a farm of their own, uh, just about an hour's drive, uh, out, or 45 minute drive outside of Calgary. It's a goat farm and they, uh, they make goat cheese there. And uh, they giggled and said, yeah, but once it's wrapped, how do you ship the goat? So I have a suggestion and here it is. If you wish to give overseas or even within Canada, the gifts with mission for mission and service are online. Just go online and you too can give. I know that one of my traditions every Christmas is uh, that to all of my uh, family, I give a gift with vision. Each one is, 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 at least I attempt to make it suitable to what their passions are in life. So if you wish to give, that's one way to do so. I know many of you give so generously to King Cardin United Church, whether it's uh, uh, through envelopes you mail in or uh, pre-authorized remittance or all of the other electronic means available on our website. I thank you. Let us take all that we give, our time, our talent, and our treasure, and ask for God's blessing on what we give. We offer into your mission, living Christ, these gifts rooted in our loving. Sometimes we become weary in the giving, so bless us with your joy. Sometimes we are challenged by the need, so bless us with your generosity. In faith, we are inspired by your call, so bless our gifts as you bless us in our giving. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's join together in the final hymn, just a little bit of a rouser, Go Tell It on the Mountain. So go into the world as people who are gathered by the sender of love, upheld by the one who came in love, sent out in the power of love, so that you can go tell it on the mountain that Christ is alive and lives in the way that we live our lives for love. Amen. <laughs>